Hi, welcome to our video on mutations. I figured I'd start this off with 16 pictures of 16 different colored human eyeballs because a picture like this really gets at the immense variety in biological systems. And of course, all of that variety is fundamentally the result of mutations. The question that we're really gonna try to answer here in this video is how do mutations happen? In this video, we're gonna look at the causes of mutations. We're gonna look at the effects of sequence level mutations at the DNA level and the effects of genome level mutations involving larger pieces of DNA before we discuss the significance of mutations, both in terms of disease and in terms of the generation of the variety that's necessary for evolution to occur. Mutations can be caused by a lot of different things. Elements in the environment that cause mutations are referred to as mutagens. These can be things like the chemicals in cigarette smoke. So for instance, this metabolite that's found in a cigarette smoke actually goes and integrates itself into the double helix, which can cause mistakes to happen during replication. Or they can be caused by things like ionizing radiation. Ultraviolet radiation, for instance, is notorious for triggering the formation of thymine dimers, wherein adjacent thymines on the same nucleotide strand wind up bonding together instead of bonding across the strands like they normally do. But probably the biggest source of mutations is DNA replication itself. The error rate for human DNA polymerase is about one in every hundred million base pairs during its first pass through the genome, copying the DNA. Polymerases do have an error correcting mechanism, which you can see here as this cartoon polymerase is replacing the mismatched adenine with a complementary guanine. And so through the action of these error corrections, we wind up reducing the overall error rate to something like one in every 10 billion base pairs that's replicated. That's certainly an incredibly low error rate, but it's by no means perfect. Anytime your genome is copied, there's roughly a 30% chance that a mutation will occur. If we follow it back to the point that the sperm or egg cell that gave rise to you was produced, all of those rounds of replications that led to both of those cells mean that there was about 130 new mutations in you that were not present in your parents. And of course, that's true every time a new person is produced. Now that we know how DNA works to produce proteins, we can have some understanding of how mutations have an effect. Let's look at a couple of the major types of sequence level mutations, mutations that are happening at the individual base pair level. The first type we're gonna look at are substitutions. What I have here is a sample template strand of DNA. This is gonna be transcribed into this mRNA sequence and the codons are then going to code for this particular amino acid sequence. In a substitution mutation, one base in the DNA is changed into another base. In this case, we're changing a guanine into an adenine. This is then going to lead to a change in the mRNA sequence, which can lead to a change in the amino acid sequence. Instead of putting alanine into the polypeptide chain, this mutation has led to the substitution of valine. Substitution mutations are generally referred to as point mutations because it's only one spot in the DNA that's being affected. The other major type of sequence level mutations are insertion or deletions. Again, we have our template strand and our mRNA sequence and then our amino acid sequence. An insertion or deletion works exactly like you think it would. A, an extra base is either inserted or one is removed from the strand. In this case, we've inserted an additional adenine nucleotide into our template strand. This then leads to the production of a different mRNA sequence which then leads to a production of a very different amino acid sequence. Insertion or deletion mutations are referred to as frame shift mutations because they affect every codon that's downstream from the point where the insertion or deletion occurred. You can see that in our example. In our point mutation, only one codon was changed, but in this insertion, every codon downstream from the point where that adenine was inserted is going to be affected. We've moved the entire reading frame for the ribosome, which is why it's called a frame shift. So what kind of effect do sequence level mutations have? Well, really it depends upon the specifics of the particular mutation. Mutations can be silent. They can have no effect. The mutation could occur in a region of the genome that doesn't actually code for a gene, in which case it would have no effect, or it could cause a codon for an amino acid to be turned into a different codon for the same amino acid, in which case it would still be a silent mutation. If a mutation occurs within a gene and winds up changing a codon for one amino acid to a codon for a different amino acid, that's referred to as a missense mutation. The effect of a missense mutation depends upon the specific nature of the amino acids that are involved. Generally speaking, if the missense mutation causes an amino acid with particular chemistry to be changed to an amino acid with similar chemistry, it's not really going to have a big effect. On the other hand, if the missense mutation causes a significant change in the chemistry of the amino acids involved, the effect can be pronounced. 
Sickle cell anemia, for instance, is the result of a missense mutation, and that's a significant effect on the physiology of the organism. The last type of sequence level effect is what's known as a nonsense mutation. A nonsense mutation results from the generation of either a premature stop codon or the removal of a stop codon, which would then allow translation to continue. In pretty much every case I can think of, this is going to result in the production of a garbage protein that does not serve any role in the cell's physiology. Looking at slightly larger mutations, we do see mistakes that occur during cell division that involve large regions of chromosomes. We can think about these as genome level mutations. These can be things like deletions of large segments of chromosomes, duplications of large segments of chromosomes, or inversions of large segments of chromosomes so that the information is reversed. We can also see things like insertions where a segment of a chromosome is broken off and placed into another chromosome or translocations where regions of chromosomes are broken off and swapped between the two chromosomes. Remember that in each of these, we're talking about large segments of DNA, many hundreds of thousands or even millions of base pairs in length. Cell division can also lead to problems with chromosomes. If chromosomes fail to separate normally during cell division, you can get what's called a non-disjunction, where one cell winds up with an extra chromosome or a missing chromosome as a result of that failed separation. So there are a lot of different ways that mutations can occur. Let's pause and talk about the significance of mutations. I can't stress enough that mutations are the ultimate source of all of the variation that we see in living things. The different colors that we see in these flowers are the result of mutations. The differences that we see in different people are ultimately the result of mutations. And that way we can think about mutations as the raw material for evolution. Of course, we normally think about mutations in a negative way, and that's certainly the case that mutations can cause diseases. This chart shows some of the common changes that we see as a result of mutations that lead to different types of diseases in humans. There certainly are quite a few of these. Because mutations can have such detrimental effects, cells have systems that reverse mutations. Well, this graphic shows the enzyme photolyase, which exists in order to undo the thymine dimers that are caused as a result of exposure to ultraviolet radiation. You're going to be exposed to ultraviolet radiation anytime you're outside and the sun is shining at you. So there's going to be some accumulation of mutations as a result. It makes sense that cells have systems that reverse the effects of most of these mutations. But it's important also to understand that mutations are the raw material for evolution. And it's through mutations that we get not only changes in the physiology of organisms, but we also get increases in the total amount of genetic information that we see. This diagram is showing you the evolution of myoglobin, which is a protein that's only found in mammals in different lineages of mammals. You can see the differences in the myoglobin protein in these different animals, which is entirely a function of the mutations that have occurred in the different lineages of the animals shown in this tree. But mutations can also increase the total amount of genetic information. The notion that mutations have to be destructive is a common misconception, but it's certainly not the case. Duplication mutations that occur in genes can lead to production of extra copies of genes, which can then serve as the starting point for, new, for the evolution of new proteins as those duplicated genes acquire mutations and begin to diverge in their structures and functions. This chart shows all the different globin genes that are found on human chromosome 11. Each of these proteins came from the same ancestral source gene that's been duplicated over evolutionary time with the variations that the descendant genes acquiring leading to new structures and functions in humans. So while in many cases mutations are absolutely harmful, they can be silent or they can be beneficial to the organism in terms of helping the organism survive and reproduce, which of course leads to the evolution of life on Earth and has ultimately led to the wide diversity of life that we see on the planet. Thanks so much for watching this video on mutations. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain what happens during sequence level and genome level mutation events. Make sure you can explain how mutations can be negative, neutral, or positive in their effects. And finally, make sure that you can describe how mutations connect to the evolutionary process. If you can do all of those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have, and then do what you need in order to get the answers to those questions. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.